We said we'd look at DC Motors, uh, their construction, their, their uh, performance and so on, their characteristics. As you know, this is a follow-on. We already had uh, a more an in-detail uh, look at PWM controlling motors, so we won't be covering that today except in one small instance near the end. But it's mostly about their construction and uh, benefits and so on. So the most common one that are, is in use is the iron core DC motor, the most common one for modern railways, I should say, by far. So that's the, the, the usual image that they show for its construction, just a coil rotating inside a pair of permanent magnets. But I thought maybe I ought to do some kind of uh, animation to show it working. And then I thought, well, that already exists. So I looked at this one and I'll, I'll play it. It's only a couple of minutes long. It's, uh, it's ENGG.things. If you're interested, it's a YouTube video. So, and there's a YouTube uh, link for up the top. I thought we ought to play it. A DC motor consists of an armature that rotates within a magnetic field. The armature has a coil of wire wrapped around an iron core. A source of electricity is connected to brushes, which make contact with the commutator on the armature. The commutator is a kind of switch that changes the direction of current flow in the coil as it turns. The electric current flows from the source to the motor and back to the source in one direction. The current carrying wires in the coil experience forces in the presence of the magnetic field. When current is flowing through the coil in the direction shown, the segment of wire near the south magnetic pole is pushed downward by the magnet. The segment near the north magnetic pole is pushed upward. In this way, the magnet causes the armature to turn. After each half turn, the commutator reverses the current. Forces on the coil reverse, and the turn is complete. The cycle repeats, making the movement continuous. That's a side view of one. A very common one for modern railways, which is a, a three-pole version. So you have the, the iron core. And each pole's got its own winding, and they're switched, as you saw, with contacts. And the magnets are surround it, in this case, uh, in a, a can. But the important point to make here is that the magnet remains stationary. It's the coil that rotates within the magnetic field. There's, in practice, what a, a typical three-pole DC motor looks like. You can get them with multiple poles for better performance, of course. In model railways, you sometimes get five poles, sometimes get seven pole, but very common were the old three pole versions. There's examples of them. The one in the top left is more associated with cheap toys. The one on the right, the Tenshodo, is one that's used in model railways. Motor Bogey is one of my favourite websites. Pretty good range of particularly N-gauge, and uh, I use them for 009. The Harling range in particular, the one you see there, that's the one that we use a lot for our exhibition layouts. We used to use Kato's, but we discovered that they didn't have the, the, the life for long running compared to the Harlings. But they pay more for the Harling, of course, it's about twice the price. Anyway, moving on. I thought I would look at, first of all, performance. And we've all got this problem of GRK starting. What I mean by that is you turn up the speed, nothing happens. You turn up the speed again, nothing happens. Turn up the speed a third time and it just shoots off. You don't get a smooth uh, acceleration. It just suddenly goes from stationary to, to fast in, in extreme cases. What are the causes? Two particularly I want to look at. Stiction, which is this short for static friction. 
that tries to prevent the movement between two touching surfaces. And cogging I'll look at in a minute. Let's start with stiction. What I've got, there's a little video I made. It's just an ordinary motor taken from a, a toy. But you'll notice when I play it, that it runs quite happily at 1.4 volts. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the, the power down again to zero, take it back up, and you'll see it won't start at 1.4 because of stiction. Let's have a look. It's running quite happily at 1.4 volts. It's now stationary. I'll turn the voltage back up to 1.4, but nothing will happen. I have to keep on going to about 2 volts. And that difference between the 1.4, which is a, a running speed, and the 2 is due to stiction. Cogging, something slightly different. mainly happens when the motor's stationary, but sometimes at slow speeds. Because of the mechanical construction, you'll notice that we have permanent magnets on either side and three iron poles, and it tends to want to rotate to, to a preferred position. And that means when it's in that position, it takes a bit more effort to get it to, to move away to, before it starts rotating. Let's have a look. Again, a little video I did where I've put on a voltage, not enough to actually get it started, but you'll notice that when I put the voltage on, it tries to move and I take the voltage off. If you watch the up here, you'll see that it moves back, partly to do with the gearing, but partly to do with Cogging, let me just show you. So we've got a problem for slow starts between stiction and cogging. How do we solve the cogging situation? Well, at the bottom here, you'll see the typical construction for an older DC motor. And the segments that make up the poles, as you'll see, have straight edges. The modern technique is called skewing. You'll see that the, the iron is at an angle, and that minimizes the effect of cogging. There's a five pole there, you can see one, two, three, four, five poles. There's even more clearly there, the effect of skewing. So the skewed motors are now more popular in model railways for that reason. Right, another issue is overheating. Overheating just means that it says you're generating more heat than you can conduct away any one time. The sources for that heat are either electrical, usually the wire resistance because the the coil that's wound round the iron isn't just producing electromagnetism. Magnetism. It's also producing heat because of the because of the resistance of the wire. Right. So heat becomes a problem either in situations where very hot locations. You know, very, very stuffy um, loft or whatever, or where you overload the local. We'll look at that again a bit later. Examples at the bottom of mechanical ones are faulty bearings, either faulty or not properly lubricated, generating heat, or sometimes you get short circuits in the windings of the coil, which leads to excess current. Why am I raising the overheating issue? Well, it becomes apparent uh, in a minute. Because I want to look next at coreless motors. Coreless motors, as the name suggests, suggests 
have no core. We'll show that in a minute. There's typical examples. You can recognize them quite uh, right away normally because of their small cylindrical shape, very common. Ones on the left show their size. Ones on the right show ones that are used in model railways. Very, very common in drones, but they're also used in other situations, as you'll see there, barcode readers, etc. We have one here that's been dismantled, so you can see it. But essentially, you have a cylindrical magnet around which the winding rotates. That's the difference here. The magnet is not rotating, the magnet is stationary, it's a coil that it's rotating. You still have to have commutation because you have to get the, the current to the, through the, the windings. But the shaft is connecting not to the magnet, the shaft is connecting to the coil. The advantages are, well, we don't have any iron to speak of in, in this setup. That means they're much smaller. Also means they're lighter, which helps performance. In fact, in some cases, they, they're not using copper wire for the coils, they're using aluminium wire to make it even lighter. Because they're small and light, they respond much more quickly to changes. So you get faster acceleration, you get faster deceleration and so on. And because you've only got one solid magnet, there's no cogging, because there's no preferred position, because it's the same all the way around. So it's got those advantages. It also has a lower starting voltage. And as you'll see shortly, and works at a much lower current, as you'll see shortly. And because it runs on reduced current and reduced voltage, there's less arcing from the commutation. So there's less electrical noise causing interference, but also the brushes have a longer life because they're not being arced away. There's an example very commonly used by narrow gauge modelers. Nigel Lawton. <coughs> you can see just how small that particular motor is. It's only 16 mil long, but only eight mil across. Very tiny. It means you can build very tiny locos. If you look at the size of that motor compared to an average resistor, you get the idea. That particular one, as you'll notice, is belt driven. And this, because it's so small, we've got an example here where it's built in and we have the motor hidden under here. You can buy them. Graham Farry should do one for N gauge. Bachman do one for double O. You can see there's the motor tucked in there. Cato do it with their P42s. Cato now bring out a motorised chassis for N gauge to the cordless motor. I've got one here and I can run it at 1.5 volts and it takes off quite happily at such a low voltage and at that voltage it only consumes 3 milliamps which is substantially less than you'd expect for an N gauge local. And then there's the local that Craig bought 
from the end gay society, and you can just see tucked away in there, there's the cordless motor. So cordless motors, in other words, are becoming more and more popular because of their performance, uh, their low current needs, their low voltage needs, their acceleration and deceleration performance. It's got disadvantages, though. We said that there's no uh, large iron core. The iron core slowed down the performance of, of a, an iron core motor. But on the other hand, it did help dissipate the heat. It's effectively a large heat sink in terms of the, the lump of metal. So you don't have that iron core to, to help dissipate the heat when the local heats up. Therefore, cordless motors are more subject to overheating. And you have to be careful about handling overloads or stall currents where you can actually burn out the, the local. Another disadvantage lies in using it on DCC. They tell you, be very careful, make sure you don't have DCC straight onto the local itself. And if you do use one with a DCC decoder, make sure it's a high frequency decoder. If it's a low frequency decoder or DCC raw will actually destroy the motor. But with these precautions, a cordless motors are becoming more popular for, for lots of good reasons. I was testing out the little hunslet that Craig gave me, I showed you earlier there. And I'm sure you've all come across the idea of or the phenomenon of different speeds. You run the local, it'll go faster forwards, it'll go backwards, for example. Very common. And I tried it with the little Hunslet. I got a, a one metre piece of track. I ran it at a, a low speed and it took 12 seconds in one direction forwards, but it took 14 seconds in reverse. So it was two twelfths uh, slower, which is a, a substantial performance difference. And I'm pretty sure a lot of you have come across that, that phenomenon. And I thought, why is it? Because the construction of a motor, you would think, should work exactly the same whether it's going forward or reverse. So the quick look, and it turns out that's true. You can get motors that will perform exactly the same in forward or reverse. But manufacturers say, well, in most cases, a DC motor is going to run in one direction, especially in model railways. So there's a thing called Commutator advancement. I'm not going to try to explain it. You can uh, Google that if you like. But essentially, what they're saying is that the construction of a local is not exactly centric. It's optimized for going in the forward direction. So it goes slightly faster in the forward direction. And of course, the color of that is it goes slower in the reverse direction. At first, I thought the, it was to do with um, the, the actual mechanics of the, the of locus, especially with valve gear going round and all that, the friction that was involved in that, and that may have some effect. But in actual fact, most motors for model railways have got this commutator advancement uh, built into them in their construction to improve forward performance. Right, and lastly, brushless motors for completeness. There are very few uh, model railway locals I could find that use it. It's mainly used in things like wash machines, dishwashers, that kind of thing. Right? Brushless, by definition, there's no brushes, therefore there's no brushes to wear out. So brushless motors are handy for motors that are going to be running for prolonged periods of time. You know, pumps and so on. Because otherwise you're going to have a lot of problems with the commutator getting jammed up, needing replaced new brushes, all that kind of stuff. So brushless motors are used a lot in industry, but less common in model railways. So the brushed motor, is, as we said earlier, it's got a commutator. The brushless motor 
the coils are stationary and the magnet rotates. So what we're doing here, there's no brushes. So if you can imagine they've got a magnet in the middle, it's got its own polarity. If we feed current through this coil, it's going to repel the magnet, which will start to move over to, say, clockwise. If we then switch current from that coil to that coil, it now will, will repel the magnet, which will rotate in that direction. And we switch the current to the third coil and then back again. So we're not using commutation, we're doing electronic switching of the coils. If you, if you think of it, we need some kind of electronics up here that says switch one, switch two, switch three, back to one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And that makes the, the, uh, the rotor rotate. It needs, in other words, extra electronics. You can't just put 12 volts onto a brushless motor. That's what a larger one looks like. We have the coils, we have the magnets. We're using a Hall effect sensor to know where we are for, for measuring the pulse rate, to know when to switch between one coil and another. The little diagram I showed you had three coils. Obviously, there's a lot more in this one here. And the coils have been stationary. This whole body is going to rotate. It's called an outrunner. The benefits, it can do fast speeds. There's much less friction without brushes. It's got higher torque, quicker response, longer life. Because there's no sparks, there's no noise, electronic noise that is generated by a cordless motor, and you get better heat dissipation. And there's no cogging effect. Having said all that, I could, the only one I could find that used it was a Marklin Local. So it's in use, but very, very rare. As you can see at the bottom, it's mostly used with radio-controlled boats, radio-controlled cars and so on. Because you need a, an extra module called an ESC, which is electronic speed controller. A little module that's going to switch between the coils. Okay, so that's looking at the three different types of motor we find in model railways. So I wanted to look next at back EMF. For those who've uh, come to the basic electronics course, we looked at motors and we also looked at, we said that motors are also generators. If you can apply a voltage to a coil to spin a magnet, why not spin a magnet inside a magnetic field and create voltage? So that little diagram at the top is of a, a motor. We apply current where it says the supply and the motor turns. If instead of it being a supply, we put, say, a light bulb across here and then spun the motor, we're going to get current. That's a, that's an ordinary DC motor, just a very ordinary motor. It's got its own uh, shaft, and normally you'd put current on these two wires. Instead, I've put a, an LED on it, and if I spin the motor, hopefully you'll be able to see that it's generating a voltage. So a DC motor is also, uh, a DC generator. Why is that important? We'll come to that in a minute. That's what I just did. I also had this little one, which I thought was quite cute. It's just two stepper motors. They've connected together. And I'm going to move one and it'll move the other. But 
there is no DC power source there. The voltage generated by the one on the left moves the one further up. So what exactly is back EMF? Well, there's the three uh, principles of back EMF. That, that the voltage that you generate is directly proportional to the speed. You imagine that to be true. The faster you spin the motor, the greater the voltage coming out of the tags. Second principle, the voltage you generate isn't much less than the voltage you apply to make it turn in the first place. Just a few losses. And thirdly, and more importantly, why it's called back EMF, the electric motor force, the voltage, the back voltage, in other words, opposes the voltage you put in the first place. And it's commonly shown like that. If you imagine the, the yellow circle is the motor, the R is the resistance of the coils, you put a voltage across it, I'm showing a battery there, but I've also got a virtual battery, if you like, in here. Because as the coil rotates, it generates a voltage, and that voltage is the opposite polarity to the supply voltage. And that affects how things work. Because if you think of, say, a 12 volt motor really isn't running at 12 volts. It's really the 12 volts you, you supplied take away the back EMF, and what's left is the voltage that's actually going to make the motor rotate. So that causes other problems because when you overload a, a, a train, the good of the load naturally means it slows down. If you slow down the, the loco, that means that the motor's spinning more slowly. If it's spinning more slowly, you're generating less back EMF. It's less of a dynamo. If it's less of a dynamo, then it's generating less back voltage, therefore the current goes up. And that's why if you overload a loco, you have to generate more current to compensate. And of course, that's one of the problems about stalling. When you stall a loco, there is no back EMF, because it's stationary. It can't generate a voltage in reverse, and therefore you get the full current. Let's see what that means. This is an example. I'm assuming they've got a 6 ohm DC motor fed by a 12 volt supply. When you start up, at the very beginning it's stationary. Therefore you're going to get, by good old Ohm's law, 12 over 6. It will take two amps going through the coils for a very short time until it starts spinning. And then once it starts spinning, it generates its own back EMF. So let's assume at full speed, the back EMF is 11 volts. Therefore, at full speed, the current is going to be the 12 volts minus the 11 divided by the 6 ohms. And that gives you a typical 166 milliamps for a modern local. But that same motor, if it stalls for whatever reason, and it's still on the track, and it's still got the 12 volts, but it can't move, then no back EMF, they're getting two amps through that coil of the motor. Two amps at 12 volts is what, 24 uh, watts. In other words, your motor inside your local is more uh, heat generated than your solder nail. That's why they burn out. That's why stalling is such a great problem. And that's why it's a, such a big problem for uh, the, the motors that are that have got a very small uh, amount of uh, iron in them to, to dissipate the heat. So that's one of the problems about back EMF. And let's, let's just have a quick look. There's an, 
There's that same motor example. I'm going to play it. You'll see that. It's only taken, what, 30 milliamps until I stop it with my finger. And it suddenly shoots up to 120 milliamps. If you caught it, I'll just play it again. 30 milliamps normally. Off the scale when it's stalled. Right, so stalling is a big, big problem, and it's due to the back EMF not being present. But we can use back EMF to good effect. In the past, it was only a problem, but some people now see it as an opportunity. Let's get back to our pulse width modulated signal. So pulse width modulation means that if you pulse it at 12 volts down to zero, up to 12 down to zero, then there's always 12 volts at some point, except when you're stationary, there's always 12 volts at some point across the coils. These pulses could be short, they could be long. If they're short pulses, then the amount of current over the period is reduced, of course. But you're constantly giving 12 volt pulses to the motor and that prevents uh, stalling. It helps with uh, smoother takeoff, etc. If you pulse it half the time on and half the time off, it's equivalent of running at half speed. And if you get to the point where it's always on, it's the same thing as putting on pure DC. Right, so that's a quick resume of pulse width modulation, but the the point I want to make is it's pulses, there's times when it's on, in other words, there's current going through the coil, and there's times when there's no current going through the coil from the supply, but the motor's still free wheeling. And that means we can detect any back EMF during that time. There's a couple of DC controllers. They call it feedback. Give it a bit of jargon name. This is back EMF. So it measures the back EMF to give you a smoother uh, operation, smoother control. Back EMF, when it comes to DCC, you'll find all kind of fancy names depending on the jargon coming from the PR department of the supplier. Digitrax call it scalable speed stabilization, hyperdrive, blah, 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 blah. They all mean back EMF detection. So if you see those labels, you know that those controllers support back EMF. But what for? What's back EMF used for? Well, let's how, how do we detect it? There's a scope looking at a typical DCC signal. There's lots of pulses involved here. Some are narrow, some are wide and so on. And that dictates what the signal that's sent. It dictates whether it's uh, local seven, go forward at half speed or whatever. We'll be encoded within those pulses. But we can look at what voltage is generated in between. That's the pulses only that's coming from the DCC controller. If we can then read the voltage that the motor generates in between, I can do that with it. I can keep the rotational speed constant. In other words, if we see that we're going up a hill and it's slowing it down, you would detect a difference in back EMF and then you could compensate by turning up the voltage a bit higher again. Similarly, going down the hill, if it's starting to accelerate too fast, you get too much back EMF, you can detect that and then cut down the voltage to the motor. And that smooths out the, the progress. 
Locals also tend to change speed going over turnouts or when the, the track is not strictly engaged at some point, it's a bit sticky and various other things like gearing snags, coupling, uncoupling and so on can, can all lead to changes in back EMF. You've got to decide then, folks, do you want that? Because you can switch back EMF on or off in your DCC. Because in the real world, trains going up hills go slower. <laughs> trains going down hills go faster. Do you want it to be all smoothed out? Mind you, if you don't have well, lots of multiple levels in your area, that might not be an issue. Your issue may be more to do with the track not being quite in the, uh, in, engaged you know, and so on. And if it's all in the flat, you may prefer to have it switched on to give you better performance going through points when you're trying to uncouple and so on. So that lets you decide using the CVs of a DCC decoder. CV10 is commonly used. It's called the EMF feedback there, back EMF. You can decide whether you want it on or not. And then different manufacturers have got different add-ons to that. You'll see Digitrax use CV55, 56, 57 to have extra trimming if you want it. Izu use 51 to 56 and so on, which is out with you know, this table. So CV10 switches it on in the first place or off. And if you've got a particular DCC decoder, you're able to take uh, further action by tweaking other CVs. So back EMF can be a curse or an opportunity or both, depending on how you use it. And that, folks, takes me to the, the, the end of the presentation. I'm sure other members have got lots of uh, experiences they want to share.